नमस्कार दिस इज फर्स्ट पोस्ट यू वॉचिंग वैंटेज विद मी पलकी शर्मा begin with Pakistan and their Kashmir obsession their prime minister went to Saudi Arabia to offer prayers during Ramzan and to ask for more loans because his country is broke but then he raised Kashmir and got a snub from the Saudis we'll tell you all about it in the US a big win in the chip race the Taiwanese chip giant TSMC will make chips in America because they're getting billions in incentives we'll look at how much money governments across the world are pouring into what has clearly become a strategic asset In Europe a landmark climate lawsuit where the court pulls up a government for not doing enough yesterday we told you about the Indian Supreme Court's ruling so can you take your government to court for not protecting you against climate change what does the law say we'll tell you about it a win for India and Myanmar this is about the Sithwe port household debt is rising in the country what does that mean why are world leaders flocking to tiktok despite security concerns what is zimbabwe's new currency why did they need one in the first place is big tech stealing your data to train ai what does it mean for copyright laws why sierra leone has declared an emergency because drug addicts are digging up human skeletons and what is your biological age can you reverse it all this and more coming up the headlines first The US sent seized Iranian weapons to Ukraine. The arms were seized while being transferred from Iranian forces to Yemen's Houthi rebels. The US military says the weapons were sent to Ukraine last week. Kiev is facing a major shortage of arms and ammunition as Moscow intensifies its offensive. Turkey imposes trade restrictions on Israel over the Gaza war. The curbs will cover products like cement, steel and iron. The decision comes after Ankara claimed that Israel had blocked its attempt to airdrop aid to Gaza. Israel vows a response accusing Turkey of violating trade agreements. In India a setback for the Delhi chief minister Arvind Kejriwal the Delhi high court has rejected his plea the jail chief minister had challenged his arrest by the enforcement directorate the court rules that the arrest was not illegal Nepal police clash with pro monarchy demonstrators thousands take to the streets in the capital Kathmandu demanding a return to monarchy in 2008 the Hindu majority nation became a republic after its parliament abolished the monarchy Hundreds of doctors in Kenya joined the nationwide strike. Many medics have been protesting since the 13th of March demanding better pay and working conditions. Last week their union had rejected an offer by the government. And another milestone milestone for the Indian stock market. Sensex hits a record high touching the 75,000 mark for the first time. The Nifty 50 also surges above the 22,700 level. Imagine this. You are broke. Your family is barely making ends meet and your debt is piling up. So you decide to visit your wealthy friend. Maybe they'll give you a loan or invest in your sinking business. But once there, you decide to ask for something more. You ask for their help to acquire some land. Land that belongs to your well-off neighbor. What does that make you? Ungrateful, yes. but also delusional and that is what pakistan is their prime minister shahbaz sharif visited saudi arabia over the weekend yes he discussed the financial situation but he also raised kashmir and did riyadh play along or did they dismiss his concerns we'll come to that in a bit but first the visit sharif had a lot of engagements lined up he performed umrah in mecca attended a high profile iftar dinner and also met the saudi crown prince mohammed bin salman or mbs Now this was Sharif's first foreign trip after taking office as prime minister a bit of a no brainer really Saudi Arabia is the leader of the muslim world it's also a big investor in Pakistan so in recent years most pakistani leaders have picked the kingdom for their first trip Imran Khan did this in 2018 and so did Shahbaz Sharif in 2022 and now he's done it again so we come to the discussions next what did MBS and Sharif say about Kashmir let me quote the joint statement The two sides stress the importance of dialogue between India and Pakistan to resolve the outstanding issues between the two countries especially the Jammu and Kashmir dispute to ensure peace and stability in the region. 
Let me simplify that for you. MBS told Sharif, sort it out yourself. Don't expect our help. Do not expect the global community's help. Talk to India and figure it out. And why is this important? Because this is also India's position. Pakistan has always tried to internationalize the Kashmir issue. We've seen that at the United Nations. Every year, Pakistani prime ministers talk about Kashmir in the General Assembly. They also release statements via the OIC. That's the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, OIC. It's a group of 50 plus Muslim nations. But India rejects all of this. New Delhi says, this matter is bilateral. We do not need Saudi Arabia's help or America's help, and definitely not the OIC's help. That's what MBS also told Shehbaz Sharif. And it's not just on Kashmir. Recently, a new flashpoint has emerged. British media reports accused India of targeted killings inside Pakistan. Now, India has rejected these claims, but Pakistan says, we told you so. They think it's some sort of vindication. But MBS, it seems, is not buying it. He says, all outstanding issues must be discussed bilaterally. I assume that also includes these new reports. It tells you how Saudi Arabia and its policy have changed. At first, the kingdom was Team Pakistan. They supported Islamabad on Kashmir. But in the last decade, that has changed. India has emerged as a top buyer of West Asian oil. So Riyadh has diluted its position. It has dehyphenated the relationship. Meaning? Both relations are separate from each other, Saudi-Pakistan and Saudi-India. Which brings us to present day. Saudi Arabia had earlier promised major investments in Pakistan, some $25 billion of it. Now, both MBS and Sharif discussed this plan. They agreed to expedite the first wave of investments. And how much is that worth? Around $5 billion. So Riyadh isn't abandoning Pakistan yet. They have thrown Islamabad a lifeline. And what does Sharif do? Ask for support on Kashmir. You see, Pakistan's claim has always been nonsensical. But now it's self-destructive. Just look at some of these numbers. Poverty is almost 40% in Pakistan. The currency has lost 96% of its value in five years. Inflation is almost 29%. Foreign debt is $87 billion. And foreign exchange reserves stand at $8 billion, barely enough to cover two months of imports. This is a country that can just about feed its own people. It is hurtling from one bailout to another. And what does Pakistan ask for? More support on Kashmir. It was always a mission impossible for Islamabad, but now it's a suicide mission. Pakistan would be better served managing its own land. Or should I say, mismanaging it. And speaking of priorities, for most countries worth their salt, the priority is chips now, semiconductors. A global contest is underway. All key players are competing, trying to woo the major chip makers of the world. And this week, the US has scored big. It has managed to win over TSMC. That's the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, TSMC. It's the world's biggest chip maker. TSMC will build a factory in the United States. And this is a significant commitment. TSMC will invest $65 billion on this expansion, $65 billion. And where will this money go? Towards building three chip-making plants in Arizona. When will these facilities go online? The rollout could begin next year, meaning the first Made in America chips could be out next year, but all three plants will be operational only by 2030. And how did America win this deal? TSMC, after all, is a giant in chip making, the go-to manufacturer for companies like Apple and NVIDIA. They could have invested anywhere they wanted. So why did they choose the US? Because Washington offered the best concessions and subsidies. The government is giving $6.6 .6 billion to TSMC. This is in the form of grant, $6.6 .6 billion. On top of that, the company can get $5 billion in loans. So overall, America has extended more than $11 billion in benefits to TSMC. It's a fantastic offer. So the company agreed to raise its investment commitment in the US. Earlier, they'd set aside, some, set aside some $40 billion. This was for the factory in Arizona. They were anyway going to build it. But now they will invest $65 billion. So they've increased it by $25 billion. And for the US, it's both a strategic and a financial investment. They want to win the chip race. They control the technology. They have the expertise to make advanced chips. They design them. What they lack is the production capability. 
Do you know how many advanced chips the U.S. makes today? Zero. No wonder Washington wants to change this number, so it has set itself an ambitious target to boost production and command a 20% market share by 2030. That is their target, 20% market share. TSMC can help the U.S. get there, but it's not the only company they're depending on. The U.S. is engaging with other companies too. It has set aside a budget of some $50 billion, more than $50 billion, just to give out as grants to chip makers. So the Americans have the firepower to win this chip race. But like I said in the beginning, every major player is competing and they're all willing to make big bets. And America's biggest challenge comes in the form of China. Beijing has set aside some $140 billion for its chip industry, $140 billion. This money will be spent over five years. It will be used to incentivize production, extend subsidies on equipment and set up more fabrication plants. China's goal is to become self-sufficient. It wants to do both, design and manufacture chips. As of today, they have the manufacturing capability, but they fall short on the design front. China is also a big market. In the month of January alone, the sale of semiconductors in China crossed $14 billion. And companies like TSMC also make chips in China. They have two factories in Nanjing and Shanghai. Plus, China has poached talent from Taiwan. In 2019, 3,000 Taiwanese engineers were working in China on semiconductors. So there is codependence between the chip-making industries of Taiwan and China. And the U.S. and its allies want to break this. They've been trying to isolate China by slapping export restrictions on chip makers and by denying Beijing important chip making tools and components. But so far, the plan has not worked. Despite the curbs, China's imports have surged by over 90%. We are talking about imports of chip, chip making equipment, a 90% jump. At this rate, China could give the US a run for its money. Then we have Europe. They're doing their own thing. Promising money to chip makers, last year the EU cleared a plan to ramp up their investment in this space. And how much are the Europeans promising? More than $45 billion. This will be a mix of public and private financing. The money will go towards both manufacturing and R&D, research and development. A few days ago, Japan too made a new pledge. It has promised another $7 billion in subsidies. Japan couldn't supply the semiconductors, which are now produced by TSMC and JASM. I believe that as the construction of these factories progresses, the missing piece in Japan's semiconductor industry will be filled. We believe that this will contribute to strengthen Japan's entire supply chain. In all, Japan is pouring in $33 billion in its chip industry. What about India? Well, India is doing its bit. In February this year, New Delhi cleared investment proposals worth $15 billion. These are private sector investments aimed at setting up chip-making plants in the country. Moral of the story? If you're in the chip-making business, you're entering a golden era. Governments around the world want to expand capabilities and they're willing to invest big money in this. And this investment underscores how chips have become the new strategic asset. Do you know what was special about last month? It was the hottest March on record. Do you know what was special about the month before that? It was the hottest February on record. And the month before that? The hottest January on record. I think you know where this is going. Global temperatures are rising nonstop. The last 10 months have been the hottest on record, the last 10 months. Just look at the average temperature. It was 1.6 degrees Celsius higher than in the 1850s. That's the industrial age. Such temperatures have real world impact. They have triggered a drought in the Amazon, wildfires in Venezuela, and another drought in Southern Africa. In Western Africa, there's a heat wave. Mali seems to be the worst affected. More than 100 people have been killed by the relentless heat there. And how high did the mercury go? In some places, 48.5 degrees Celsius. It's important to put this temperature in context. Northern Mali is mostly desert. There's virtually no vegetation there. Plus, healthcare is a luxury. The capital, Bamako, has around 4,000 medics. The rest of the country has just 3,500. So such heat waves can be a death sentence. And you know the worst part? 
Mali is not responsible for this erratic climate. Their emissions are negligible, less than 0.01% of the world's total. 0.01%. Yet the people of Mali are paying the price. And that's climate change for you. Is there any way we can stop this from happening? Well, activists have tried many methods. We've seen traditional protests and sit-downs. We've also seen borderline vigilantism. Things like throwing soup at paintings or raiding government buildings. Great for headlines, not so great for getting work done. But now a new method is emerging. Climate litigation, taking your government to court. We spoke about this yesterday. India Supreme Court gave an important verdict. It said, citizens must be protected from the effects of climate change. The court linked it to a fundamental right. And today we saw another verdict. This time from the European Court of Human Rights. This lawsuit was filed by a group of elderly Swiss women. And, and their complaint? The Swiss government was not doing enough to tackle climate change. That was their complaint. As a result, they had been left vulnerable. And the court agreed with them. It said the Swiss government was at fault and that the inaction violated some fundamental human rights. Now, this verdict is important for a couple of reasons. One, it's the first such verdict by this court. And two, it could affect 46 countries. That's how wide the court's jurisdiction is. But could it offer a template for the future? Listen to this. And this is only the beginning of climate litigation. All over the world, more and more people are taking their government to court, holding their, them responsible for their actions. Um, and this, me, uh, the results of this can mean in no way that we lean back. This means that we have to fight even more. And data supports this. In 2017, the United Nations reported 884 climate litigations. By 2022, it had reached more than 2,000. So clearly, the lawsuits are increasing. And you can see why. Governments are not responding to public pressure. They promise to cut carbon emissions, yet they keep investing in fossil fuels. So what else can citizens do? They've tried protesting, they've tried hooliganism. So now they're approaching courts. But can these lawsuits really make a difference? That depends on two factors. Number one is the judges. You see, most constitutions do not mention climate change. They were drafted in a different time, a time when climate change was not understood. So you won't find explicit mentions of this issue. And that's where, where judges come in. They can choose to expand the scope of existing laws. Just take India, for example, and let me quote from the recent Supreme Court verdict. This is what the court said. The right to equality under Article 14 and the right to life under Article 21 must be appreciated in the context of the decisions of this court. The actions and commitments of the state and scientific consensus on climate change and its adverse effects. And just to be clear, Articles 14 and 21 already exist in India's constitution. They guarantee right to equality and life. So the court said it applies to climate change as well. Other national courts could do the same. It's about perspective and will, which brings us to the second factor, and that is enforcement. Again, this is uncharted territory. When a person is illegally arrested, we know what the recourse is. The court can say, release them. But what's the recourse for climate change? Can the court stop governments from investing in fossil fuel? Can they force governments to implement emission cuts? These are all tricky questions, but they're also important ones. Human rights have changed and evolved with the times, and we have depended on courts to protect those rights. No reason why climate change should be any different. Meanwhile, in Myanmar, despite the conflict between the rebels and the junta, India has managed to hold on to its strategic gains. This story is about the Sitwe port. It's a deep water port in Myanmar's Rakhine state. It was developed and funded by India, and now it will be operated by India. This week, the government of India has approved a proposal. It says an Indian company will run the Sitwe port. The company is called India Ports Global. This is a state-owned enterprise, so you could say that the, the Indian government will now be running the Sitwe port. And this is significant. Sitwe is India's second overseas port. The first is the Chabahar port in Iran. And despite the challenges in Myanmar, first the coup and now the escalating civil war, India has not abandoned the Sitwe port. 
This deal, in fact, was signed way back in 2008. That's when India and Myanmar agreed to begin the project. It took 15 years to build, and New Delhi's support has been firm throughout. When the port was inaugurated last year, the first deliveries were sent from India. India sent 1,000 metric tons of cement from Kolkata to Sithwe. Officials from India attended the inauguration. Among them was India's shipping minister, and it shows the level of New Delhi's commitment. Before the ceremony, the Indian minister hailed the project. He said it would unlock access to Southeast Asia. It is a good start, but India needs to do more to realize this goal. In fact, this port is, is part of a bigger project, the Kaladan Multimodal Transit Project. Under this, Sithwe will be connected with roads. The final goal is to link India's northeastern states to a port in Myanmar, to give them port access. The entire project is expected to cost $484 million. So the port is just the beginning, sort of like a stepping stone. Without the land links, India won't be able to harness the full potential of Kaladan, and the next phase is going to be challenging. Like I said, this port is in Rakhine. And in recent months, Rakhine has seen intense fighting between Myanmar's junta and the rebels. The rebels have taken over large chunks of territory, including the Chin state. And this state is part of the Kaladan project. Reports say the conflict has disrupted road construction, which includes a highway near the India-Myanmar border. As of February this year, work on the highway had come to a halt. This was due to the rebel offensive. The highway passes through some of the worst affected regions, and India too has been concerned about these events. Soon after the fighting broke out, New Delhi issued a travel advisory. It asked Indians to avoid visiting the Rakhine state. So what is the current situation like? Well, it hasn't really improved. Just today, fresh reports came in. Hundreds of soldiers surrendered to the rebels. This happened in the town of Mayawadi. It's near Myanmar's border with Thailand. This town has an important border crossing which facilitates trade between Myanmar and Thailand. And it seems like the rebels now control it. And they continue to gain ground. Recently, they sent a message to New Delhi. The rebels want India to stop supporting Myanmar's military. So far, India has not responded, but it has decided to end the free movement of people living in the border region. The situation has become more complex, certainly. India still maintains control over the Sithwe port, and this should be seen as a positive. But India needs stability in Myanmar to be able to build on these gains. And for now, its only option is to keep patience and stay the course. Staying with India, a new report says Indians are borrowing more than ever, which is strange for our society because most Indians see debt as a bad thing. They prefer savings and solidity. So why are they taking loans now? First, let, let's look at the numbers. What do the numbers say? Financial services company Motilal Oswal has prepared a report. They found that India's household debt is at a record. How much? Almost 40% of the GDP. At the same time, savings have dropped. It's just 5% of the national GDP, which is the lowest in 47 years. So to recap, <coughs> Indians are taking more loans and they're saving less. What do these loans look like? Most of the debt is unsecured personal loans. These are loans given without a guarantee or collateral. Then come the secured loans, agricultural loans, and finally business loans. Do we know why this is happening? The report mentions a number of factors, like weak income growth, a strong consumption market, and rising physical savings, basically things like gold and real estate. Now, this report raises a couple of questions. One, what are people saying about it? And two, should you be worried? Well, reactions are mixed. The opposition is blaming the government for it. They say incomes have been low, inflation has been too high, hence people are borrowing and dipping into savings. And what does the government say? On this report, nothing yet, but in the past, the finance ministry has rejected such claims. They say people are taking loans to buy assets, things like cars and real estate, which means they're confident, not distressed. Now to question two. Should such reports worry us? Well, India's central bank does not think so. That's the RBI, the Reserve Bank of India. In January, the RBI had released a financial stability report. It said household debt does not pose systemic concern. We also looked at other countries. In China, for instance, household debt is 63% of the GDP. 
In Thailand, it's 91%. In Vietnam, it's 61%. In Brazil, it's 34 And in the US, around 64%. So India's ratio is comparatively better. Having said that, the rising debt also reveals something about the Indian consumer. They're not conservative anymore. They like to spend on what they love. A recent consumption survey confirmed this. Urban Indians are consuming 146% more than they were in 2012, 146% jump. Rural Indians are consuming 164% more. And it's not just the amount, it's also what they're spending on. Earlier, most of the income was set aside for food, but that's not the case anymore. Food makes up only 46% of rural consumption in India. So it's less than half. In urban areas, it's even lesser. Just 39% of the consumption is food. But if Indians are not spending as much on food, what are they spending on? Durable goods, things like gadgets and machines. These goods made up just 2.6% of total consumption in 1999, but now it's almost 7%. So clearly, there is a shift happening. Indians are venturing out into the market. They're exploring different products. Just look at vehicles. More than 4.1 million vehicles were registered in 2023. More than 4 million. That's 8% more than the year before. Same with credit cards. India now has around 94 million credit cards. Credit card spending increased 28% last year. We can't say why this happened. Critics will say because the people are running out of money. The government will say because they're confident, but chances are it's a bit of both. The new India is not scared of taking loans. They like to spend on durables and luxury. Clearly, they're deriving confidence from the robust national economy. At the same time, it's important to back up this habit with more jobs, more growth, and more fiscal discipline. TikTok has a new subscriber. It's German Chancellor Olaf Scholz. He's finally taken the bait. Scholz is on the Chinese social media platform. His account will show the daily activities of his government, and he's not the first world leader to join TikTok. French President Macron is on it. So is US President Joe Biden. He joined in February. And all these leaders may criticize China, raise security concerns about its tech platforms, and suspect TikTok of spying and data leaks, but they keep joining it. Why is that? What makes it irresistible for Western leaders? Their young voters are on TikTok, so it seems the need to reach these voters outweighs security concerns. Here's our report. I will not dance. That was Olaf Scholz's promise as the German Chancellor made his debut on TikTok. The video started with a tour of his office. It ended by showing Scholz on his desk. The account is the new government channel. It will offer behind-the-scenes videos on how the government functions every day. Of course, Scholz isn't the first world leader on TikTok. Plenty of them are on the app. In February, Joe Biden joined TikTok. The US president is using the app as a bid to reach out to young voters. French President Emmanuel Macron joined TikTok during the pandemic. He boasts of 4 million followers. Mexican President André Manuel López Obrador, too, got on the app this year. And there's a reason why. This year, over 63 countries are going to polls. Nearly 3 billion people will be voting. And one app is influencing them. TikTok. It's being called the TikTok election year. The app is owned by the Chinese company ByteDance and has over 1 billion users globally. Now, TikTok may be popular, but there are allegations of interference and fears over national security, essentially the baggage of China. But the youth are still on this app, which has left Western governments in a bind. In an ideal world, probably German politicians uh, wouldn't want to use TikTok, but since so many young people are using it in Germany, um, the decision is right, I think, to go there and use it. Otherwise, they will only receive political content from the extremist forces. Take Europe, for example. It has 142 million TikTok users and 20 million of them are in Germany. Around two-thirds of young people are using TikTok in Germany. Elections for the European Parliament will be held in June. 16-year-olds will be able to cast their vote, which makes reaching young voters particularly pressing. But it's not just a Western scenario. The TikTok fever is global. 40 world leaders are on the platform. Many of them have an active presence. 
the most followed leader is Imran Khan. He may not be the Prime Minister of Pakistan, but he has a following of over 9.3 million. Then there is Naib Bukele. He's the president of El Salvador. He has 8 million followers. Brazil's president, Lula da Silva, has over 4.4 million followers. Bong Bong Marcos, the president of the Philippines, is also very popular on TikTok. He has around 1.6 million followers. Italy's Giorgia Maloney is the only female world leader in the top 10. She has over 1.5 million followers. So world leaders are using TikTok. They are reaching out to the young. But they are also worried about Chinese interference. Biden says he may be on the app, but he will support a full ban on TikTok. Shows you the dilemma for the West. They are caught between using a Chinese platform and the need to reach the youth. As they say, if you can't beat them, join them. And that's what world leaders are doing right now. Our next story comes from Zimbabwe. They've introduced a new currency and abolished the old one. The new currency is called Zig or Zimbabwe Gold. Before I tell you about it, let's go back in time for a primer. The year was 2008. There was a global financial crisis. Countries were struggling and so was Zimbabwe. It was dealing with hyperinflation. Prices were on the rise. Daily goods were becoming very expensive. So the country's reserve bank came up with a plan. A $100 trillion note. This one. It was one of the world's largest denominations of currency. Still is. $100 trillion. This was to match market prices. Now, $100 trillion sounds like a lot of money. It has 14 zeros. But it was worth less than half a dollar. Around 40 cents. And why am I telling you about this? Because Zimbabwe has always struggled with money. They keep introducing new currencies. This week was their sixth attempt since 2008. Sixth attempt. First, they introduced the Zimbabwe dollar, then abolished it, then reintroduced it, and now they've phased it out again. And what will replace it? A new currency called the ZIG. That is short for Zimbabwe Gold, Z-I-G. Now, this new currency will be backed by gold. What does that mean? It means that its value will depend on Zimbabwe's gold reserves. The new currency will come in a few denominations between 1 and 200. It will immediately replace the old currency. The people of Zimbabwe have 21 days. They must exchange their old notes for the new ones. And the old notes are almost worthless. Currently, one US dollar is worth around 30,000 Zimbabwean dollars. One US dollar versus 30,000 Zimbabwean dollars. The new zig will be valued much higher. One US dollar will be nearly 14 zig. Now, Zimbabwe says it's going to be a game changer. It will give the country a stable currency. We are doing what we are doing to ensure that our local currency does not die. As I said, we were already in a situation where almost 85% of transactions are being conducted in US dollars. Because our local currency was not giving, was not living up to the function of store value. But can the ZIG really do the magic? Not really. You see, Zimbabwe has long dealt with inflation. In March, annual inflation was at 50%. The interest rate was at 130%. The economy is struggling. The Zimbabwe dollar is not worth the paper it's printed on, which is why people don't use it. 80% of all transactions are done with the US dollar. Other foreign currencies are also in use in this country, like the South African Rand, the British Pound, the Indian Rupee, the Japanese Yen, and the Chinese Yuan. All of these are in circulation in Zimbabwe. But even with the ZIG, can Zimbabwe stabilize the economy? Experts are skeptical. A gold-backed currency is not a new idea. Countries have done it in the past, especially in the 19th century. It was called the gold standard. Countries fixed their currencies to gold. It led to rampant economic growth. But that changed with the world war. Soon gold standard became history, and that has been the case since. But now Zimbabwe wants to replicate that success, though it comes with its own set of challenges. First of all, the volume of gold reserves. Zimbabwe is backing its currency with gold, but it doesn't have enough in reserves to prevent fluctuation. It doesn't have that kind of gold. So maintaining a stable exchange rate could be a problem. The second problem is volatility. During the gold standard, the value of gold was kept stable. You would not see major price fluctuations. Countries worked to ensure that, that the gold prices remained stable. But this time, Zimbabwe is doing it alone. 
and gold does not have a stable value, which exposes this currency to volatility. So does that mean that the zig will not work? Well, it's too early to say. This is a first for any country in the 21st century. It's almost like an experiment now. Currently, no other country has a currency backed by gold. Some others have tried different things, like El Salvador. They adopted Bitcoin as an official currency. It did not change anything. 80% of El Salvadorians still do not use it. The same could play out in Zimbabwe. They can introduce currencies all they want to, but that will not ensure stability. For that, Zimbabwe needs to bring its spending in line, address things like fiscal deficit and sanctions. Unless that happens, this won't lead to meaningful change. For our next story, let's talk about AI models, the likes of ChatGPT and BARD. They train on large amounts of data, articles, videos, audio transcripts. But where do they get this data from? Chances are they get it from you. It's your data. A new report has accused big tech of training AI models on millions of YouTube videos. Now, YouTube's policies say that this is not allowed. But the report suggests that companies use legal loopholes. Does that violate the copyrights of creators? Can you sue these companies for using your content? Do copyright laws the world over need an overhaul? Our next report tells you. Are top AI models violating the copyrights of creators? It's a question that has been raised from time to time. There has been no definite answer, but a new report has shed some light. It says top tech giants used YouTube videos to train their AI models. How? By using the transcript of millions of videos. Take OpenAI, for example. The report claims the ChatGPT maker was desperate for samples for training. It needed it to train more models. So it developed an audio transcription model. It was called Whisper. The model transcribed millions of YouTube videos. It was used to train ChatGPT4, its most advanced large language model. However, it is not the only company accused of YouTube data mining. The report also accused Google. It says the company was doing the same. It was using YouTube videos to train its AI models. So is this legal? Not really. Google says it is against its policies. It says it doesn't allow unauthorized scraping or downloading of YouTube content. In fact, YouTube CEO even talked about this before. He said there could be a possibility that OpenAI used YouTube to train its Sora video generating model. So why did Google not pursue it? The report says it's because they were doing the same. Google may have known about OpenAI's transcript heist. It may have known about its illegality, but it chose to turn a blind eye because it was doing the same with YouTube videos. And what does Google have to say about that? The company says it did train some of its models on YouTube content, but this was done with the permission of creators. Which brings us to AI models and copyrights. All AI models are trained on huge swathes of data, but the content they are using, not everyone is too happy about it. Big media companies have filed lawsuits against these companies. They are calling it copyright infringement. What is copyright? In simple terms, it's a type of intellectual property that protects original works. It points to the legal right of an owner. So the original creators of anything are the only ones with the exclusive right to reproduce the work. Of course, computers cannot do anything without making copies. So copyright laws come up all the time. Which brings us to fair use. What does that mean? It says that certain kinds of copies are okay, but it isn't a one rule fits all. What is fair use in one legal system could be illegal in another. With artificial intelligence, it becomes even more complicated. Companies will argue these machines cannot function without data, but others will call for appropriate compensation for that data, which means copyright laws could be looking at an overhaul. It may not happen anytime soon, but with more and more AI models and the need for more data, companies will have to look into what can be used and what stays out of bounds. Our next story comes from Sierra Leone, a country in West Africa, home to 8.6 million people. It has declared a national emergency, not over economic or political turmoil, but rampant drug abuse. This is about the so-called zombie drug, also called Kush. This drug has been around for years. 
It is a psychoactive blend of addictive substances, including opioids, and human bones. And that's what's complicating matters, the fact that it has human bones. Because now some people are digging up skeletons from graves. Can the government put a stop to this crisis? Our next report tells you. Sierra Leone is facing an existential crisis. We aren't saying this. President Julius Mada Bio is. Now the West African nation has declared a national emergency. Not over political or economic turmoil, but over rampant drug use. And the culprit is one drug in particular, Kush. This is a psychoactive blend. It consists of addictive substances like opioids, marijuana and human bones. That's right, one of the drug's many ingredients is human bones, and an important one at that. So much so that addicts are digging up skeletons from graves. They say I need to flush this from my body. I started taking this five years ago. My system is now addicted to Kush. The drug has been prevalent in Sierra Leone for years, but in the past six years, the youth have fallen prey to it in large numbers. The nation's youth unemployment rate is further compounding the issue. It stands at 60 percent, one of the highest in the world. Now, President Bio has called the drug a death trap, but that's not its only nickname. Kush is popularly called the zombie drug. Why? This is a potent synthetic drug which affects the physical and mental state of addicts. They stand like zombies with shoulders slouched head tilting to one side, shuffling about aimlessly. Many are without shoes. Their feet are swollen from infections. The toll on mental health is just as bad. The country has only one fully functioning mental institution. Between 2020 and 2023, admissions linked to Kush surged by 4,000%. What we see in the hospital is, can be likened to the tip of a nice bag where only the severe cases are being brought. But if you go down to the communities, if you go down to the parks, you go down to the streets, you go down to the ghettos, you'll find much more you know, people using these substances and the impact has been created on them than what we see here. But that's not the worst of it. The drug is killing people. Sierra Leone has not released official numbers, but experts say fatalities are increasing. Young people are dying. We need a speedy and we focus strategy to see how young people are taken from this drug intake. But at the threat is at, but at the moment it is quite alarming. So what is the government doing about it? Security has been tightened in cemeteries so people stop stealing human skeletons for ingredients. The government is trying to boost all law enforcement agencies so that there are more investigations into how the youth are getting their hands on this deadly drug. Currently, Sierra Leone has only one rehab centre in the entire country. Experts say it's more of a holding centre than a rehab. It lacks adequate facilities. Plus, the drug is manufactured and distributed by criminal gangs. Until there's a crackdown on them, the supply chain will persist. So, Sierra Leone may have declared a state of emergency, but what it needs are focused measures to tackle the root cause. Until that happens, it will continue digging up old graves, quite literally. Now a question. How old are you? How old are you really? And I'm not asking about your chronological age, which is the number you commemorate on birthdays. I'm talking about your biological age. This refers to how old your body really is. Not long, not, not how long you've existed for, but how old is your body. And these are two completely different concepts. Because time may be equal for all of us, but we all age at a different rate. I'll give you an example. According to research, men age 4% faster than women, which explains the difference in life expectancy. Women live longer. They tend to live longer. They outlive men by about 6%. So how can you quantify your biological age? How can you measure it? By understanding your cellular health. This refers to the health and functioning of your body down to each individual cell. 
It shows you how much damage your body has suffered, damage that comes from natural aging, also from environmental factors, lifestyle patterns, and pure luck. We know what damages the human body. Eating unhealthy food, not exercising enough, smoking, living in poor conditions, even poor genetic makeup. All of this and more harms the body. So it goes without saying that people with a healthy lifestyle have younger bodies. They have a lower biological age. For instance, people with great cardiovascular health are six years younger biologically than their actual age. So biological age is just a number. But it's a number that you can change. You can actually lower your age. If this sounds exciting, do know that scientists are way ahead of you. There are blood and saliva tests now that can tell your biological age. And this is a recent phenomenon. Research is still underway, but scientists are scrambling to perfect it. Why? Because there are many benefits here. Biological age testing can help predict physical illnesses. For example, when your heart ages fast, the risk of heart failure is 250% higher. It can also predict the progression of brain disorders, like Alzheimer's disease. According to a study, people whose organs are aging faster than the rest of their body have a 20 to 50% higher risk of mortality. But that's not the only reason why people want to know their real age. We as a society are obsessed with youthfulness. Consumers reportedly spend $62 billion every year on anti-aging treatments. There are creams, hair dyes, and Botox that give the impression of youth. And now people are shelling out hundreds of dollars, getting their blood analyzed to find out their biological age. Then they're deploying anti-aging hacks, like pills, diets, or replacement surgeries. Some are even swapping their blood with that of teenagers, and I'm not making this up. Some of you may have heard of, of this man, Brian Johnson, a man on a mission to reverse his age. He's 46 years old, but his biological age is 18. He has spent $2 million on anti-aging methods. He has upended his life completely just to function like a teenager. And this is an extreme case. Thankfully, everyone is not going to such lengths. But many are falling into other traps. They're taking biological age tests online. They're also collecting, these tests are also collecting data for pharma companies. Or people are taking costly offline tests that are under-researched. People are also getting duped by taking conventional blood marker tests, masquerading as something more. So should you be taking a biological age test? Well, the answer is tricky and completely subjective. If it's just for fun, then an online quiz will not do much harm. But if you have a health concern, it is always better to visit a doctor than taking a random test yourself. And if the goal is to simply live longer, knowing your biological age may help, but it won't roll back the hands of time. For that, you'll just have to switch to a healthier lifestyle. And now it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. Russia and Kazakhstan are witnessing the worst floods in seven decades. Across parts of the US, Canada and Mexico, millions enjoyed the total solar eclipse. Meanwhile, Niagara Falls made a new record for the most people dressed as the sun. Finally, we're taking you back in history. On this day in 1940, Nazi Germany invaded Denmark and Norway during the Second World War. Denmark surrendered. It was occupied almost immediately. Norway resisted for two months, but later surrendered to the Nazis. We're leaving you on that note. Thank you for watching. We will see you tomorrow.
срочно нужна 